Good morning. If you would take your seats. Actually, why don't you stand up because we're going to sing our opening hymn, which is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And open to your first page of your bulletins. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our psalm for today is Psalm 121, which let us say together in unison. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh even from the Lord, who hath made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. 
and he that keepeth thee will not sleep. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself is thy keeper. The Lord is thy defense upon thy right hand. So that the sun shall not burn thee by day, neither the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. Yea, it is even he that shall keep thy soul. A reading from Revelation. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more and the sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes.
Please be seated. I'd like to invite Mr. David Parshall to come up and introduce our speaker. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Jim Kinnear this morning. Jim has led such a noble and accomplished life that a complete introduction would extend much longer than his remarks to us will be. I will limit myself to a few highlights. Jim is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and served three consecutive tours in the Korean War, earning seven engagement stars and a Navy Commendation Medal for rushing to the aid of wayward parachutists during a refit in Japan. After his war service, Jim joined Texaco, where he initially pumped gas and washed cars <laughs> at a Texaco station. Then rising over the course of time through a number of positions to become the company's CEO in 1987. He pulled the company through a bankruptcy and a massive restructuring and put a large focus on innovation and technology. Now, Jim's late wife, Mary, contributed to his corporate success. Here's one example of her tactical advice in a tricky situation. When Jim was thick into his role as CEO of Texaco, he faced at one point a tangle with activist investor Carl Icahn. Wise and inspired Mary had the right idea. She said to Jim, why don't you send him a Christmas card? <laughs> it worked. Upon receipt of the Christmas card, Icon, deeply touched by the gesture, called up Jim, invited him to lunch, and magically, that broke the ice, or at least sort of. <laughs> it didn't solve everything, but it did ease the way. In addition to his many years of admirable service, admirable service to Texaco, Jim also has served on a number of corporate and nonprofit boards, including as one of the original members of the board of the Naval Academy Foundation and as chairman of the board of the Metropolitan Opera in the 1990s. He has been and continues to be a most, most generous with his time and all of his resources including with uh, his presence with us here today. Jim attributed his leadership and problem-solving skills to his time at the Naval Academy. He once wrote, leaders are driven by their dreams of success for the enterprise rather than themselves. They lead by words and example. They must be accountable. And above all, they must have and must project a strong sense of ethics. Well, throughout his life, Jim, has, Jim is the personification of his own words. On a personal note, Jim and I both grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania, and it turns out we're distantly related, as that can happen among people who <laughs> live, whose families have lived for many generations in the same place. Please join me in welcoming my eighth cousin, <laughs> James W. Kinnear III. Thank you, cousin. Uh, that was very, very kind of you. And uh, my, uh, my father would have loved that, and my mother would have believed every word of it. <laughs> <laughs> On this Memorial Day, we pause and we give thanks, and we honor those men and women who gave their lives so that others might live in freedom. In 1776, we fought for our own freedom, and in our many conflicts since then, 
We have fought for the freedom of others, of peoples around the world. For me, there is no place that I would rather be today than here in St. Peter's Cemetery and memories of those who have served before to remember the bravery of self-sacrifice. My own service extended to Korea where 1,700,000 Americans once served and where over 36,000 Americans gave their lives in combat. We gladly sailed to defend a people whom we did not know in a country we had never seen, but we went. The years 1945 to 1950 had been years of demilitarization in our country for our U.S. Armed Forces. All branches had shrunk in size. The Navy had mothballed almost all of its capital ships. In the summer of 1949, only the USS Missouri, BB-63, was available for our midshipmen summer cruise. We had to split the brigade into two and make two cruises, one to France and one to England. Some of the Marine squadrons stayed on active duty, such as VMF 323. VMF stands for Heavy and Heavier Than Air Marine Fighter Squadron. VMF 323, our first squadron. Our second squadron had gone into the reserves, and our pilots had started their families and begun their careers keeping their flying skills up on weekends. When the call came, <coughs> when the call came, they returned to battle. The Son of God goes forth to war, a kingly crown to gain. His blood-red banner streams afar. Who follows in his train? Who best can drink his cup of woe Triumphant over pain, who patient bears his cross below, he follows in his train. Thus began the recessional anthem at the United States Naval Academy when I graduated on the 2nd of June of 1950. Mary and I were married June 17th and began our honeymoon in California where my first ship was based. On Sunday morning, June 25th, we walked onto a tennis court. A voice rang out from somewhere I do not know. A voice rang out, ho, ho, Lieutenant, I know where you're going. President Truman had just sent the Seventh Fleet to Korea. At that moment, my bride of one week became a Navy wife. We hastened to my ship, bade farewell, and I got underway. I reported aboard the USS Bedoin Strait, CBE 116, a very small aircraft carrier, as a freshly minted ensign with a half dozen others. We were rotated between engineering and deck duties, and all were trained to run the encryption machines that were used to send and receive coded messages. We all spent four hours a day on encryption watch uh, on the ship. I started in the engine room, and I was soon promoted to the bridge where I became an officer of the deck, OOD. When the ship was underway, this was a very responsible job that involved keeping the ship on station, dealing with emergencies, ordering the maneuvers of the task group, and following the captain's orders. What do I mean by dealing with emergencies? 
Well, in the Navy, that can mean almost anything. One day, we were having carrier qualifications off California of torpedo bombers. And uh, the bombers were not carrying any torpedoes, so we were able to deck launch them. We didn't have to use our catapults. And they'd come roaring down our deck. Now, our deck was only 500 feet long, just about the length of this tent. And it, they would roar, and they would get into the air. One of them was, went screaming past the bridge, got to the bow of the ship. There was silence, absolute silence, total engine failure. The ship, the aircraft crashed into the ocean somewhat, somewhere off our starboard bow. Now at ship handling school, they tell you when this happens, you give a right full rudder, which moves the stern very slowly to port. Looked over there. Right full rudder, we moved slowly to port. By the time the plane was coming down the starboard side of the carrier, the pilot was standing on the wing, and when he got next to the bridge, he saluted. We had him back on board with the helicopter in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so that's when I say the, the kind of emergencies that can occur at, at any time. Two years later, when I was transferred to another ship, I said good, went to say goodbye to the captain. His name was Roy Johnson. He became a four-star admiral and commander of the Pacific Fleet. Jimmy, he said, everybody called me Jimmy, he said, I always slept better when you had the deck. For a naval officer, there is no higher praise. The Bedoyne Strait was a very small aircraft carrier. VMF 323, our squadron, landed on our 500-foot flight deck in their F4U Corsairs. That's the one with gull wings like that. They were our main battery. What do I mean by main battery? I mean that they carried about 2,000 pounds of various explosives. They had 500-pound bombs. They had 50-gallon napalm tanks. Napalm is jellied gasoline with a phosphorus igniter. It is a very nasty weapon. They had eight high-velocity aircraft rockets, and they had four machine guns, all on one airplane. They were our main battery. Their skill at close air support was matchless. Combat operations in the Naktong River peninsula of Pusan began in early August. In September, it was the landing at Incheon, where 27-foot tides and 10-knot tidal flow made ship handling very difficult. Let me tell you something about ship handling in Korea. Yes, the tides were 27 feet, which means you get tidal flow, changes every six hours, of 10 knots going in one direction, and then it turns around and 10 knots going in the other direction. Well, when your ship is an LST that can only make 10 and a half knots when everything is working, and everything is not always working, it is very difficult to navigate. So that, uh, in, in addition, the waters all around coastal Korea had mines. They were left over from the Japanese in the Second War. So we had to keep the ships in the mine channels. We had many mine sweepers doing this. Three of our mine sweepers did hit mines. They went down virtually with all hands. A very, very dangerous operation. But that's what ship handling was all about in Korea. In addition, in November, the North Korean army, which had invaded South Korea in June, was essentially destroyed. We wiped them out. Home by Thanksgiving was the word in the fleet, and we really believed it. Then, in November, the Chinese forces, at least 240,000 strong, crossed the Yalu River and entered the combat. The snow, by this time we're in November, December, 
The snow was very heavy. The U.S. 1st Marine Division and the U.S. 8th Army were at the Chosin Reservoir up there in the north part of North, what is now North Korea. And the fighting was devastating on both sides. Our Corsairs were heroic in their defense of the 1st Marine Division. By Christmas, withdrawal was ordered. And our, ship became, and our ship's job became that of protecting the port of Hung Nam. That's the sea, sea uh, coast port from where our ships could uh, rescue our troops and many Koreans. The Navy and the Merchant Marine managed safely to evacuate 104,000 U.S. servicemen and 91,000 Koreans who were saved by their movement to South Korea, south of the 38th parallel. The war continued up and down the peninsula with enormous casualties. During my two tours on the Bedoyan Strait, we had lost five of our brave pilots to enemy anti-aircraft fire. We had 12 aircraft and 24 pilots on board. Close air support is effective, but extremely dangerous. For my third tour, I was transferred as executive officer and navigator to an LST, USS LST 516, in the Yellow Sea supporting guerrilla warfare. On one day that spring, the spring of 1953, we were moored offshore Kyushu, the north of Kyushu, some, I would guess, about three miles offshore from the Oita Airport. There, the 101st Regimental Combat Team was practicing parachute drops onto the runway before, deploying, before deploying to Korea. It was about 0800 as I watched from the bridge with my glasses. The wind had shifted around to the west, and the parachutists were landing in the water, not the runway. I knew they were in trouble. Riley, a second-class quartermaster, a signalman, a boatswain's mate, an engineman, and I jumped in an LCVP, landing craft vehicles and personnel, LCVP. We headed for the shore. The first two men we found were each desperately holding a buddy to his chest, unable to get rid of the ties to their parachute equipment. Riley and I pulled two men to safety. The first, Private First Class Ferguson. I can still see his face right there and the gratitude on his face as I saved his life. Pulled him out of the water with his buddy. We saved two men, but our CPR, which we tried for two hours, our CPR could not save their buddies. The 101st Regimental Combat Team was very grateful to us and our little team of four and invited me over to their base the next day to have a drink. No liquor was allowed, no legal liquor was allowed on Navy ships. I went, I was roundly thanked and found that they had a sense of humor. Their little bar, they had a little bar like this. The little bar was named Malfunction Junction. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar with parachutes, a malfunction is when your chute doesn't open. As the war wound, wound down and a truce was being negotiated in April of 1953, we received orders to evacuate civilians from the little islands of Chodo and Sokto, and they were off the coast of North Korea. These brave Koreans and our guerrilla warfare activities have been helping us, and these islands were to be part of North Korea. 
We were to save them, and these were on orders from Washington. Think about it. I beached our ship on Chodo and took on board 1,500 men, women, and children. We got underway for the Inchon Channel. Two babies were born on board in the two days it took for us to get there. We did have a doctor on board. I offered the doctor's services to the first lady, and uh, she said, no, thank you very much, and she delivered her own baby. Uh, the second lady, I offered the doctor to her. She was delighted. <laughs> I beached the ship at 3 o'clock in the morning on a little island in the Inchon Channel. I put down the bow ramp. I didn't hit the beach too hard, and so there's about three feet of water under the bow, and said, this is your new home in South Korea. Their descendants, so far as I know, are still there. Why have I told you these sea stories? It is because they are little known but part of American history. Since 1776, the most selfless history in the annals of the world, and why we remember our servicemen and women. When I left Korea in 1953, there was one bridge across the Han River in Seoul. It was a floating bridge built by the U.S. Army engineers. Today, Seoul is a city of some 11 million people, 27 bridges across the Han, in a democratic country which is our friend and our ally. Our armed, services, armed forces never turned away, and they made the world a better place. I started this little talk with an anthem. Now let us answer the question that, a po that, is a, that was posed by the anthem. Who follows in his train? I look across this graveyard, these beautiful fields, and I say to myself, and I say to you, O oh God, to us may grace be given to follow in their train. Amen. Thank you for that wonderful reflection, that wonderful moving talk. If you would turn in your bulletins to page three, we will pray together for the departed and also for our country. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Grant us, with all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, to have our consummation and bliss in thy eternal and everlasting glory, and with all thy saints to receive the crown of life, which thou dost promise to all who share in the victory of thy Son, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. Endue with the spirit of wisdom 
those to whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosper prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Together let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand and join in our offertory hymn, <coughs> Almighty Father, Strong to Save. So I'd like to thank Jim very much for those moving and very memorable remarks that he gave us. We have a <coughs> small present for him. It's a book written by Elliot Clark, also a veteran of the Korean War, who is buried in this cemetery, entitled, the book is entitled, Land of the Free and Home of the Brave. I would like to give that to Jim, but I'd also like to make two announcements. One is, all alumni of St. Paul's School and former faculty or students, please gather on that side of the tent after the service for a photograph with Jim. And secondly, David Greenwood, who is sitting in the front row, will be conducting a tour of the cemetery for any who are interested and should meet him on this side of the tent. Jim, thank you again very much.
before the taps and benediction, there are a number of people that I'd like to thank for putting together today this beautiful day with a lovely weather this time, and uh, it wouldn't happen without the help of so many. But first and foremost, to Lee Cornell and to Lillian Chapman for all the work that they've done today uh, with setting up the tent and the chairs and the refreshments. Do stay for the refreshments. Uh, to David Parshall and the Cemetery Committee, Betsy Battistoni, Lillian Corbin, David Greenwood, Mike Lysis and his family for helping to set up, Nancy Vanderley. And I think one of the reasons this went off so well this year with, without a hitch is we had uh, the help of Lois Mander all, for all these years who made sure to make sure everything was in order uh, uh, before she, passed, she handed it off. So thank you to all of those people who made today such a success. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 <clears throat>
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.